Um, good afternoon. My name's David McCracken um, from the Barangaroo Delivery Authority um, and I'm the director responsible for Barangaroo Central and therefore the responsibility for um, the request for proposal process that we're launching today. Um, I'd like to begin by welcoming you all and I'd also like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation as the traditional custodians of this land and in doing so I pay my respects to the elders past and present and extend that respect to everyone here on this important occasion. I'd also like to make specific mention to some key people here today. Um, you may have noticed already that and there's, a, there's a two panels that are involved in the evaluation here and we've got John Tabart, who will be speaking today, um, as CEO of the Authority on the Recommendation Panel, Gabriel Trainer, who is one of our board members, um, who's also here, and I also extend apologies from Aidan Ridgeway who is also on that panel. Also in attendance today are members of the advisory panel who will advise the authority, Peter Poulet, the state government architect, and Graham Yarn from the city of Sydney. And again, apologies from Carl Fender, who is another member, he's a design advisor to the authority and a member of that panel, as well as Bob Nation, our design director, who is overseas at this time. Also in the room, and the two key um, managers of this process are Fleur Meller, our public domain design manager for Barangaroo, and Peter Funder, who is the project manager responsible for Barangaroo Central. Um, on that note, I'll introduce uh, John Tabart, our CEO, to give you a very broad and high level uh, overview of our project. John. Thanks very much, David. And uh, welcome all of you. That's uh, David's introduction. Thank you for that. That David's code for me to keep it short. Um, I'd like to talk uh, a little bit about um, you know the about Barangaroo itself and its importance, just to give you the common background that's fundamental to the Barangaroo Delivery Authority. Our um, objects under the Act are very clear, um, and as are our functions. And the master planning role for Barangaroo Central is an integral part of the next step in the phase of the evolution of Barangaroo. But it, it augurs well just to sort of step back a little moment and to talk about Barangaroo itself, its history and its importance has got to be taken into account by anything that we, we do. Firstly, um, the site is well known to you, one and a half kilometres, 22 hectares. Um, on the western side of the CBD, the last piece of city waterfront uh, to be developed um, and a piece that really is vital to get it right. It's about getting it right for Sydney. It's not just about getting it right for Barangaroo. Barangaroo's importance will be judged by how well it sets Sydney in the right place for the future, helps set Sydney in the right place for the future and not just functions within its own space. It's integration with the entirety of the CBD area is very important. This slide is a slide that's been borrowed from, if you like, the concepts of Paul Keating about the integration of the Inner Harbour headlands into a space that creates something that is today but recognising and respectful of the past. Each of those headlands were covered in natural environment of the past around Goat Island, it was called Mel Mel by the Aboriginal people, and it, which means the eye, and the centre of the eye was Goat Island and the headlands around it um, are largely man-modified today, apart from perhaps Ball's Head, um, although it's heavily modified as well. So Barangaroo headland was all about becoming another headland that represented something about the past. So the recreation of the headland as a um, a recreated space that there was recognising of the foliage and the greenery and the sandstone and the edges and the, and the headland that had been there was part of recreating that space. It's important to understand that and why the headland is what it is to any thinking about master planning beyond that space. And it's a pretty important location by any measure of one of the world's greatest cities with the backdrop of the outer harbour sitting on the inner harbour and facing west. The city has for two centuries done everything it could to look out to the outer harbour. Even Goat Island was an installation to watch what was coming through the heads. And every building in Kent Street and every building in Clarence Street has stood on its tippy toes to try and look out to the northeast. 
and really the city has never focused on the west. So Barangaroo is also a western gateway to the city of Sydney and that's something that Barangaroo has a chance to focus on and say that's an important aspect that it must take into account. The history is rich and I'm sure known to some of you but it's very important that it's understood and it's recognised and the work we do is respectful of that. This is an 1823 uh, etching that may be familiar to some of you but it shows um, Miller's Point with the windmills on it to the top right hand corner and it shows the inner harbour and it shows the uses at the time stylistically with indigenous people, with wood chopping, with tending to flocks and with the canoes in the water. So uh, historically very important to understand that Barangaroo sat in this environment from that period of time and this is where a lot of indigenous people were actually displaced initially from the uses that were occurring in Sydney Cove and to the south which is the easy way to develop Sydney this place was displaced peoples for many years. And it was hard to get to. Um, the um, the, 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 the rock that formed the headland which today sits underneath the Bradfield approach to the Harbour Bridge was very hard sandstone and it was very difficult. It took in fact two shots over 30 years for the Argyle Cut to actually be finally built. In fact it was a, it was a working crew of the City of Sydney municipal workers who built it, who, who broke through for the eventual sort of breakthrough in 1850s etc after having an earlier shot in the 1830s through contractors. So municipal workers in those days did a better job than contractors. Interesting isn't it? Next. Um, true, still true today? Yeah, right. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that was Graham Yarn. <laughs> Thanks Graham. Um, so although many of these things are called Darling Harbour, this is in fact um, some of the early piers in the Barangaroo area. Darling Harbour extended at that time really from uh, Miller's Point right up into Darling Harbour. So the history is rich. This is, I guess you can see, the beginnings of the construction of the, uh, of the Opera House or perhaps it's the demolition of the uh, tram shed. So this is, I guess, you know, circa 1958 or thereabouts. Uh, let's see, AMP1 is there. Um, so yeah, around about 1960 and you can see the Barangaroo at that time was a mixture of finger piers but still um, the old the wood, wool sheds were there on around uh, Barangaroo headland and the headland of course underneath that was not field space but that was actually the original headland that had been cut down and then extended to make the rectilinear shape for ships at that time. Next, thanks. And here we have uh, the beginnings of um, the creation of container wharves uh, at Barangaroo and just part way through construction. Looking at this slide I think uh, you can see Australia Square so we're around about 1964, 65, uh, Australia Square opened in 64 so 1970 maximum but this slide. And going on again and here we have uh, the 90s uh, and just before the sheds were removed and operations stopped. Uh, in Barangaroo. So a vital part of the history of Sydney, its maritime history, um, but also the history of the development of the CBD itself. So it needs to, whatever we do here needs to be very mindful of that rich history pre-colonial times but also um, the history during the period of 200 years since then. We've been working hard as a delivery authority to try and engage the people of Sydney in Barangaroo today, not rather than wait for completion but really to show them that it was a special space and now it's available to the public. So we've opened up the Waterfront Walk and here New Year's Eve 2011, 14,000 people from wide um, suburbs all around Sydney who came into the, uh, the New Year's Eve event and this is something that really is very important to engage people in construction now while it's happening for them to understand and let them to contribute to what's going to be here at the end of the day in the public spaces. This is um, probably early in the yeah, it is early in the day of the of New Year's Eve 2011 families walking to the space and in fact if you look out there at any time from this window you'll see somebody is using that waterfront walk today. We have 10,000 people a week using it currently. Lunch times is particularly popular, morning joggers, cyclists, etc. using the space. 
half marathon. We had quite a number ran around the waterfront edge. And here, just a lunchtime. This is, um, let's see, the uh, City Dash, the Cancer Fund day. So it's all deliberate opportunity to allow people to sort of use it and understand and explore it and contribute to it before it's a finished product. The, um, the cultural ribbon extending from Woolloomooloo to the Anzac Bridge, 14 kilometres of space, but in fact in the middle of it, 1.5 kilometres of dotted space, which is now being filled in for the last time with a development of something. And the master planning of that space is what much of this today is about. Thank you. Um, this is an interesting slide because it combines the, uh, the concept a design that's been developed to a high degree and is now in construction for the Headland Park. It combines in Barangaroo South on the right hand side of the southern part of the slide Len Lease's proposal which is now in construction in part for Barangaroo South and in the centre is some space with some blocks and some open space and a waterfront edge which represents Barangaroo Central. The red arrows are really important on this slide too because they represent the fundamental connections that connect Barangaroo to the hinterland of Millers Point and the CBD. Barangaroo may be successful in its own right, but if it isn't activating the spaces around it and helping contribute to them, both drawing people into Barangaroo and letting Barangaroo provide a population to be drawn into the city, uh, then it's not doing its job. 22 hectares is not a precinct in its own right. Cities have a number of precincts. This city's probably got three or four from Circular Quay right back to Central Railway Station. And they're different precincts in character and they're usually defined by the distances that people are prepared to walk during the day for a, an activity, a lunchtime or a shopping trip or whatever it is, or going to workplace. So that means that actually 50 or 70 hectares is a precinct and that means that Barangaroo is part of the adjacent precinct in which it, which it sits. In fact, the city have a name for it. I think it's called North Harbour Precinct. Yep. So it's part of its neighbours around it and to develop it without consideration of that very carefully and how it will affect them and how they can affect it would be ignorant. So the master plan for Central, which this RFP is about, is about the whole of Barangaroo, but it's also about Millers Point and the, and the areas around it. Thank you. And here is um, an arts impression, um, a digital version of, um, of Headland Park. Thank you. And some rapid images of the Headland Park itself. In fact, we're going to run through something about this bit at the end of this presentation. So this is the northern space to which the master planning area we're talking about will connect and integrate. The cultural space within prototype of the construction of the waterfront, sandstone, Peter Walker's detailed design. And here, the whole of the space, the central piece is defined by the tall building on the right hand end of Barangaroo South, just north of the cove on the right, and right through to the cove um, in the centre of the space on the left. And the space in between is Barangaroo Central, about five hectares of space. There's some buildings shown there, but they're simply impressions of what could happen within the height limits and the boundaries of the site. Looking from the south past Barangaroo South, you can see Barangaroo Central just tucked in between there and the headland. Thank you. Barangaroo South is uh, maturing into a design which is now being built with very significant commercial office buildings, very, uh, very much of what financial services needs today. And the connection, thank you, between these buildings and spaces they'll create for 20 to 30,000 workers every day and about the same number of visitors to those spaces, plus the retail visitors for the core below and people using the waterfront, as we see in the extension of Darling Harbour today, it's vital that that harmonious space is introduced powerfully to Barangaroo Central and to the headland. The biggest generators of people using Barangaroo Central will be the people that are coming every day to Barangaroo South. There's another connection on the southern end and this is a transport connection and this is the Wynyard Walk development which is soon to be uh, to have a contract awarded to a successful design and construction consortium. 
Um, it is also a connection to the waterfront where ferries are going to be a vital part of the future of this space. The numbers of people who already walk from Circular Quay to, for example, Macquarie Bank's offices here on Darling Harbour is over 8% of their working population, which is far greater than the 2% share of people that use ferries coming into the city. So it's very interesting. 8% of their employees were walk walking 1.4 kilometres from Circular Quay up the hill and down again into their space every day and back in the evening. So the demand for ferry services here from financial services employees and work workers is very strong. So we'd say potentially 8% plus could be using ferries coming to the Barangaroo area. And it's not just Barangaroo, it's Barangaroo and this northwestern financial services precinct. Thank you. And it's all happening. If you've looked out the window, if you've been in this space, you know that it's happening in a substantial space for something which is so large. And uh, it is, um, it's an absolute milestone to achieve this work um, over the last three years from a bid process to delivering something which is already a commitment of two $1 billion buildings and uh, soon to be the commitment of a third and works on the headland already in construction. It's been an amazing journey. It's been a very difficult one. It's a very controversial project, as all of you know. Not everybody's smiling, but anyway, <laughs> it's a, it is a very controversial project in so many ways, um, but it's also been an incredible thing for Sydney to have achieved this in a marketplace that we've endured, the world financial crisis and all the things that have come out of that. It's not easy to make anything happen in this country today, as you know. Make something as big as this happen has been an incredible outcome and congratulations have to go to Lend Lease as an organisation behind making that work. But also people in government, people in the private sector that have contributed to making that happen has been incredibly substantial. Okay, we're running a little Slide through. Oh, this is about a timeline. Thank you. Just quickly, um, activities take Barangaroo through to Ju June 30, 2015 is the opening of the first commercial <coughs> tower. 1 January 2016, the second commercial tower. The third commercial tower yet to be nominated as an opening date, but perhaps it's during 2016 as well. At that time, You'll have 300,000 square metres of office space, you'll have 30,000 square metres of retail, and you have a lot of people visiting the space every day. The Headland Park opens on the same date. So there'll be a connection along the waterfront from the Headland Park past Barangaroo Central that we're talking about today into Barangaroo South from that date that people can use the waterfront just as they are today, but in an almost completed form, except where there's still some construction to going on, in which case there'll be a temporary waterfront passage for them. So that's the key date, but thereafter for the next five years, subject to demands of residential development uh, sales and uh, final tenancies and uses, Barangaroo will move rapidly through to completion. So we'd expect Barangaroo Central over the next 10 years to be completed as well, progressively, but as cultural uses become firmed up, become committed, and become funded, then that work will be completed as well. So can we run the fly through? Thank you.
So there are people um, far more qualified than I to talk about uh, master planning skills and the people that are needed for this project, but I'd just like to introduce before David discusses the RFP in more detail that finding the right master planning organisation to plan this precinct is vital as I said, but it's also not an easy task. Um, skills in master planning at precinct level are not something that everybody has had expertise in. So we're looking for the very best skills that can master plan a space which will have excitement as a master plan, will have flexibility for a variety of uses that may come from the cultural studies and be determined over time. A great plan which shows great opportunity but isn't fixed and rooted in certain issues which prevent great opportunities for public spaces but also for building uses as they're evolved and determined. There will be a cultural brief that will go with this master plan so you'll know what we're recommending to government are the likely outcomes but like every great master plan some new uses will evolve as we go through time over the next five years and some of the uses that are planned today perhaps won't quite happen that way. So the plan needs to have great flexibility. The plan needs to have great excitement from day one however. So achieving that is going to be something that's really only able to be done by a small number of professionals and we're looking for those people. So the demonstration of that in your response is something we're looking for. Show us the work that you've done, show us how you go about that work and give us a chance to choose the very best that have got precinct planning skills at master planning level. David. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks John. As, as he has suggested, we're now in, we'll now go through um, the, the briefing details through the request um, for proposal and it's important to note contrary to some opinion that's arisen since um, the media release that this is not a design competition but it's more a credentials um, evaluation process. Um, the document which is now available on, on, on the, the websites and is available for link looks something like that. That's up, that's, it's in two parts, part A and part B. Um, part A describes Barangaroo, um, the background to the site and some information about the site. Part B is about the, um, the process and the returnable schedules and of course as you'd expect part B is probably larger than part A. Um, so just to give you a, a reinforcement of, of, of John's um, parameters around the master plan, the, um, the Barangaroo Central master plan is, is a plan for a 5.2 hectare site. Um, it is presently got a concept plan approval as part of the, the Barangaroo concept plan approval which allows for 60,000 or, or just under 60,000 square metres of development. Our master plan that we're going to require will accommodate a range of these uses. It will combine civic and cultural uses that will be issued in a development brief prior to um, engagement. It will define buildings and public spaces and the interplay between them and it will be planned to respond to its surrounding area, the Harbour Village North Millers Point Precinct, as well as the predetermined anchors at either end of Headland Park and Barangaroo South. To build on what John said, what we are seeking from the master plan, it's, it's got to be a flexible yet exciting master plan. So it's got to have the ability to evolve over time. As John said, this, is in, this will be a 10 year planning window potentially for some of the facilities if they are on the civic and cultural side as they get funding, but we want to be able to enable the site um, in its short term. We have already started a process of an interim works plan for Barangaroo Central, which is underway, which is a holding pattern if we choose to go that way um, prior to the full development of the site. It'll be a plan that can evolve and be enacted in a variety of ways and allow for expression as those uses evolve and partnerships with particular uses. Cultural partnerships may, may build from being a planned 15,000 square metre use to be something beyond that and the plan must be able to be capable of that. We're not looking for a rigid land division sub, a sub plan. It's a, it needs to create in line with Barangaroo's agenda a global identity as well as a local reference point for all of Sydney. It's important that Barangaroo is seen as an integral part of the everyday Sydney experience as well as on the global map. It's got to provide spaces for buildings and it's got to provide places for people. It's got to be a plan that will inspire and create opportunity for use, users not yet, not yet determined. So what do we seek in this process from the, from the request for proposal? We're looking for an experienced and capable master planning team. We need the 
to understand your approach to combine national or international expertise as part of that team and have it applied locally. We believe we've been very successful in that part of the component with Peter Walker's involvement in the Headland Park and we're looking to re replicate that, that um, level of interaction and presence here locally from an international team if you decide to, to submit in that way. We need ev evidence of your understanding of the complexity of this task and the evolving brief and also the evidence of your design strategy to respond to that task. And we need you to under understand that this is not just about the buildings and it's not just about the open, open spaces and the public domain, but it's the combination, the interplay between both and their future expression by use and by experience. The, re the request for proposal process is an open re request for proposal, as I said. It's, in, it's been documented in two ways, the part A being the opportunity and part B the terms and conditions. There is evaluation period and there's evaluation criteria set out in the documents and we, we reserve the right to have a short listing process. If the advisory panel and the, uh, believe that they have got a standout um, opportunity, um, um, they can recommend that but we also reserve the right which is why in the timing you'll see a bit more back-ended time that we can go back to a short list with some more information and request more and more response from you. Um, we end up with a recommendation from the panel that goes to our board for, for approval. The governance structure around that, there are technical advisors, one of them is sitting in the audience, um, Russell over here from the, from the University of New South Wales who also was involved in a similar process um, with the Headland Park. And we have an advisory panel made up of Peter Poole, Graham Yarn, and Bob Nation um, and myself. And then we have a, um, the evaluation team of Peter um, Funder and Fleur Miller, who then make um, supply advisory services and, 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 and recommendations to the recommendation, which is John Tabart, Gabriel Trainer, and Aidan Ridgeway. They then make a recommendation to the Barangaroo Board. That's the process. Um, the evaluation criteria clearly set out in the document are around capability and experience in delivering concept planning for landmark urban precincts, as indicated by John, about alignment with the design excellence and innovation objectives of Barangaroo and their approach and the output of the exercise. Your understanding of place, and place particular in, in great urban spaces, but also place con characteristics consistent with the Barangaroo objectives and your fee proposal process and, and, and team structure. The program, the um, request for proposal documents went live today on the various, on the, on the website, um, 30th of August and the close on the 26th of September. It is a relatively short period of time and we feel um, because it is about credentials and approach, that's an appropriate level of time and as, as I suggested earlier, the evaluation period runs through October and into November going to a final re recommendation in December where we are targeting the, our um, authority board meeting in the middle of December for a recommendation to go to the board, leading to appointment and commencement of work, hopefully January, maybe in February of, of um, 2013. So that's, the, um, that's the, the request for proposal process and the, and the time frame and the objectives that we've set. Um, John and I are going to be available now. John, if you want to join me up the front for a Q&A session, if there is anything broader um, specifically, it is, this is not about a design briefing, um, it's about the objectives and aspirations for Barangar Central, we, we want to be very clear. Also, um, if you could introduce yourself, um, I will acknowledge now that we are filming, the reason we are filming this today is so that it can be on the website in an edited form, it's not for um, any other reason than that and the, and the comms team will have that up on the website in um, a week. I'm looking signal, it'll be live on that, an edited version, um, able to follow up again. Any questions? Okay. Yes. Can you please um, I notice in the, uh, your conversations and also in your document, uh, there are cultural, social and economic plans that you've already done and have available, assuming that they would be available to the team on starting, is that correct? Yes. And also, what about the plethora of consultation and engagement that's gone on for many years here? Because I noticed that in the schedule, it's not till stage three that you're going out to talk to people. And we have the very strong idea that when you go out, if you can say this is what you've already told us and how this springs on from that, otherwise you've already done the principles 
and the options before you listening and talking to the people of Sydney. And I'm assuming the happiest outcome would be to have the whole people of Sydney on the front of the papers saying, we want this and running around and throwing their bras in the air because they want it, rather than the other story which we all know so well. So I'm wondering what form all of that comes in, where is it, is it, would it be accessible and how that would be handed to the team? Yeah, all of that's accessible. Um, Penny, the, uh, the consultation has been deep and, ex and, and extensive as, as, as you suggest and some of it is already, um, a lot of it is already available through the website at the moment. The consultation forms the essence of the development, of the information going into the development brief and all of those documents will be made. One, they inform the development brief but they'll be available to the, to the proponents. The indicative stage work I think is, is that, it's indicative to be worked up with the preferred proponent and ensure that the degree of continued public interaction and consultation. Um, it, is a, it is an underlying belief, philosophy and mantra for the organisation to continue that, that consultation. Is the schedule, is Sorry? Which uh, I'm, I'm in your staging one, two, three on your proposed master plan scope of works. Yeah. There's opportunity for the team to move things around a little yeah. bit if they think that, that works that's better. That's why yeah, we this got it in this frozen. proposed as a guideline. We th thought we believe we should put some structure around that, but yeah. it is open to, to feedback from yourselves. Good. can often find themselves excluded from the future design of the individual buildings that are inserted into that master plan uh, under the perception that there might be a conflict of interest uh, between being the deliverer of the master plan as well as the designer of the buildings. Um, is there any such um, restriction, I guess, in that aspect for this particular competition? There's there, there is no guarantee of, of ongoing work, there's no exclusion, and I'm just going to throw to Pete who's done all the probe, that's, that's right, there's no obligation or commitment to forward work and there's no exclusion on that, so we, we could go either way. Right, thank you. It's worth, no I suppose it's worth noting at the moment we've engaged Peter Walker as the public domain um, advisor to the authority across the whole of Brengaru, so he is not submitting in this process. Um, he's on Headland Park specifically, but he has continued already engaged. He'll be part of a collaborative team, but we've engaged him separately. Right. Okay. Um, will other consultants or design team members be accessible? That are others that are engaged by the th authority already? Yes. Accessible to be part of a submission? Uh, yeah, or, or to, to talk advisors. to? Um, they're accessible to be part of the submission. And Except for PWT, Robert Group, and KPMG. They're They're all excluded? Yeah on the basis that they're engaged by us specific and, sorry, specifically and have ongoing roles with us in these areas. Yeah, yeah, I'd oh, certainly be accessible, yeah. Anything else? The members of the, um, the authority, I've got another director, Phil Paris, who's the development director responsible for Headland Park, is here. Natalie, um, Jackie and um, Juliet from our team are all here available. We've, we're just putting on a drink around the model and in, in the lobby area. Um, and John and myself um, are available for, for casual conversation um, if you'd like to stay around. But thank you for coming. And we look forward to the best responses we can in the, um, from the request for proposal. So thank you very much. <laughs>